Welcome, welcome. We're going to have some people chiming in. Now, here's what you should know. Definitely cut us up off if you guys have some questions, if you guys want to get some things answered about what we're talking about today, which is winning the talent game. It's all about practical tips for attraction, hiring, and retention in a changing landscape. This is one of four events. So today, we are talking about talent acquisition and retention, but do not miss out on the three more free events. We do not do these events free typically. So um, this is a super special month and you can see what we've got lined up over the next three events. This is not buildable content. So you can come to one event, you can come to all events, you know, the more the merrier. Um, and this event is sponsored by the shift spot. Who is the shift spot and what do we do? Well, oops, let me back up again. I'm going to get this people out of here. Um, you know, we are a CEO coaching and peer advisory community. And what we've learned is there's not any one coach or one consultant that can help uh, a CEO on all of the problems they can expect in their journey. So we've packaged them into an online community and membership where they can get uh, service in all of the different areas that they need as a CEO and business owner. And we like to say here at the shift spot, shift happens, we can help. Um, well, we just like to have fun. So um, who am I? I'm one of your hosts. I have a, a huge background in sales and marketing, as well as a lot of media appearances. But probably my most notable experience is I have a sister named Summer and a cousin named Autumn. My parents thought that would be hilarious. <laughs> And uh, it is that is actually the truth. Um, here is your other host today, Ken Paskins. We are both the co-founders of The Shift Spot. While I think I have a cool resume, I flip to this page and then I realize I'm just not that cool at all. Um, say hello, Ken, to everybody. Hi, everyone. Glad you could make it today. So while one of his most notable achievements is he closed a software, strategic software deal north of 40 million a few days after 9-11, He's actually most proud of his three daughters. And our why for doing this event is to help you find freedom in your business faster. And the reason is because we've learned that business owners sometimes suffer silently and they're expected to have all the answers themselves. So we've leveraged the collective intelligence of experts compounded with peers so that you don't have to be alone at the top. And what we've learned through community and peer support is it's the fastest way to navigate rapid change, it's the fastest way to build new practices, and it's the fastest way to pursue results and transformation. So Ken's not a fan of this picture. I, I like, like I said, we like to have fun here, but I, I think this picture represents freedom and that's kind of what we're intending to do with this free information today and what we do in the community. And today, if you stay for the whole event, we've got two awesome opportunities. One of them is a give back. The other one is a hot seat. So um, we encourage participation. We want you to cut us off. You know, you don't need to um, raise your hand, just chime in, ask a question. And if, uh, if we have enough participants, we'll put somebody in the hot seat and have your specific HR or people issue that you're dealing with handled because what happens for one person and you know their problems, it can help everyone else. The give back that we're gonna give is uh, a gap analysis to one lucky winner. So what a gap analysis is, it, it's an extensive discovery process and detailed questionnaire to help you uncover the biggest opportunities for growth in your company so that you can get crystal clarity on the focus areas for maximum impact. We hear business owners say, hey, look, there's something not working in my business. I just don't know what it is. This is the first step to making that happen. It's a $5,000 value and we're giving it away to somebody today. All right, here's what we're gonna be going over today in case you are you know, curious. We're gonna be talking all about talent acquisition and retention. And with that said, I am very, very, very excited to announce our uh, guest speaker for today. His name is Mike O'Neill. He's an HR expert. He's got SMB and Fortune 500 experience for over 30 years and held senior roles at Shaw and Mohawk. I'm not going to be able to uh, talk about your resume, Mike, in, in any way that you could. So why don't you uh, share with us a, a little bit about your background? Thank you, Winter. I'd be happy to. Uh, in short, you can read or uh, if you heard kind of what has I've done, I've spent most of my career in HR. Uh, HR uh, is a, a profession that changes dramatically. And I had the good opportunity to go to work for small companies that kept growing and growing and growing. As a result, I was leading HR for Fortune 500 companies. So you'll learn a lot in that process. But by choice, I now work with small to mid-sized businesses. I love working with owners 
presidents, CEOs of organizations kind of work through the things that pr present perhaps the most challenging part of their job. And that is the common refrain, if it wasn't for the people, I would love owning this business. I try to help them solve those people problems so that they can kind of get back to running the business. And if they're losing sleep, getting a good night's sleep. Awesome. Awesome. All right. So that's it. We're diving right into um, providing a ton of value for you today. So Mike, I'm just going to let you go ahead and um, talk to us about how, how do you win the talent game in, in today's changing landscape? Well, I'm going to make a stab at this. For this to work right, I would welcome input from you, the participants, but it kind of steps back and you kind of say, what are we kind of dealing with? And that is, why do we feel that winning the talent game is important? And it really kind of boils down to why talent acquisition and retention is so important um, today. Um, and in reality, we spend most of our time talking about finding people, but I'm going to argue, and we'll talk about that a lot today and continue on, is retaining those good employees can be equally, if not perhaps most uh, important. Uh, here's the reality. The challenge that we're dealing with right now, uh, it is a buyer's market. And if we can't figure this out as business owners, it's going to impact us. It is impacting us, but it's going to stymie our success as a company, and it's going to stymie your success and your ability to to grow your business. Uh, is the talent sh shortage real? Yes. Uh, manpower, when they went back and studied this, they found that nearly 70% of the employers in 2021 were reporting having difficulty filling positions. We all know that percentage has probably gotten much higher. So why do we even bother having this conversation? Uh, it kind of boils down to if you can attract highly skilled employees, and you can engage them, you really are going to have a competitive advantage. It's just very much apparent. Um, and if you have a, a highly skilled workforce, it's going to do so many things for you as a business owner. You're going to make sure that you keep that institutional knowledge in-house, that succession planning is much more seamless because you've been intentional about developing your employees, giving them opportunities to learn and, and grow. What we have a tendency to do when we talk about uh, turnover is we talk about how much it costs to hire someone. And gosh, it is expensive. People don't realize how expensive uh, it is. People automatically think of the, uh, the direct cost, your advertising costs, if you're filling a position internally, if you're using a recruiter, recruiter fees. But if you begin adding up the indirect cost, your loss productivity, your loss in quality, how it just is a disruption, uh, it adds up. Statistically, what they say, somewhere between 40 and 70% of an annual salary is spent when you are going out there trying to hire someone. That is staggering. And as the positions go up in the level of the organization, that percentage has a tendency uh, to grow. So what we will be doing today and continue over the, the next three sessions, we're going to be kind of wrestling with what can we do as business owners to attract, to hire, to develop and retain folks in this changing uh, landscape. And one of the things that we could talk about a variety of things, one of the things I'm finding that might be a, a good starting point is thinking about your brand as a company. And if we think about who we are as a company, we spend a lot of time defining our brand, do we not? Who are we? Uh, who is our target audience? What is the unique value proposition? But shouldn't that same thought go into establishing brand as an employer? That's my encouragement is, if you're giving thought to that from a customer standpoint, be thinking about that um, as, um, uh, as a as a, an employer, um, and that is, what is it that you can do as a company to articulate what is it we offer as an employer that's unique? What are our core values that really matter most to us? What is this culture that we're building? 
And if you can do those things, what you're going to be able to do is attract and retain the right type of employees. And, and Mike, you know, Mike, I just have a question here really quick um, on course. this your branding, because uh, Ken and I were actually speaking with an employee and he told us that he took a job with less salary and less company benefits, but he believed in the mission. It was something he could stand by. And he, he took the job because of what it meant. And when we asked him why, why his financial pocketbook took a hit for that. And he said he wanted something that he could believe in and something he could, you know, be attracted to. And we thought that was so interesting because if you nail this employer branding, right, then that's automatically going to attract the right people. And I think we have a couple examples of that, don't we? Well, and, and uh, good. Can, can you have something also? Yeah, I just just real quick. I, I, there's a lot of members in our community are actually starting to divert funds from just marketing to drive, you know, uh, top end to actually drive employees or or future recruits, if you will, to their organization. Uh, we've got one guy that owns a CPA firm and mm -hmm. he's got like 25 in employees, right? Um, and he's got this unique um, tie to a couple strategic partners that basically his opinion is I can generate and get as much money as I, uh, and as many deals as I possibly want. However, finding people is really hard. So he's actually bringing in a fractional CMO to help with his entire branding from an employee perspective, but fulfilling that gap specifically as short as talent is in the finance sector is a real struggle. So but go, go ahead, Mike. Um, I'm actually hearing that in not only standalone uh, accounting CPA firms, but also uh, the struggle for specialized talent uh, with established organizations. Accounting is, is a very good example. Um, when I want to go back to the comment you made a moment ago, because I think that's going to come through loud and clear um, as we kind of continue this conversation. And that is people who are looking for who they want to work for are looking for more than just the pay. They're yep. looking for uh, more than just what are the benefits. They're looking for a sense of belonging. They're looking for, could I see myself working for this organization and being a contributing member of this organization? And the way that that gets answered is you, the employer, um, are intentional. Now, we don't probably have on this call representatives from uh, large, large corporations, but I'm going to cite two just because they just come immediately in mind when you talk about who out there does employer branding well. And the first one that popped in my head was Southwest Airlines. I don't know about you. It seems as if when I talk to people, either they love Southwest or they hate Southwest. But for those who love Southwest, they love it for a variety of reasons. Probably the number one reason is just what their experience is uh, as a passenger, well, their experience is influenced by who the employees are. Southwest from the early days was very intentional to try to create an environment by which the employees um, were fully engaged, that they felt like family, and they did something that you didn't hear about. They had fun doing all of it. Well, Southwest has been around long enough where the data supports creating a environment where employees are engaged it feels like family and they're having fun it pays off on the bottom line southwest has one of the lowest turnover rates in the entire industry and they get consistently rated as one of the best places to work now if you've got employees who want to be there who do they tell they tell others who are like-minded they become your ambassadors um, another one that came to mind was Salesforce. Salesforce probably targets larger size organizations, but they do have products available to small to mid-sized companies. But they have been very, very intentional when they're trying to build their brand. And Winter, this goes back to something you said a moment ago. They've got a quality product. Now, yeah. it is admittedly, it's expensive. But it really does what it's supposed to do. But when they're trying to attract uh uh, employees, they know the employees that this is a high quality product that really surfaces the needs. They're probably the largest CRM out there. But what they have found at, at Salesforce is that they wanted to kind of 
key in on three core values, trust, equality, and giving back to the community. And that kind of speaks to what you just said, Winter. Mm-hmm. Um, they work real hard to instill those three things. That giving back to the community, you may think, well, that's kind of fluff. But generations right now in the workforce, that is paramount. They're yeah. wanting to go to work for companies that have kind of a higher purpose. It's okay to be making a profit. But what they're wanting is, can I believe in this company and what they believe in? Can I see my employer giving back? Does my employer give me an opportunity to give back? Do they give me time off to volunteer for causes that are important to me? Those little things add up. And that's why both Southwest and Salesforce are viewed as employers of choice. As a small so, so we've got a business. question yeah. that just came yeah. in um, here that is asking, well, um, how would you do this for a much smaller company? Wow. I didn't see the question, but I was about to kind of do that. Um, here's what I would say. A small business doesn't have the luxury of a big budget like Southwest or Salesforce, but here's what you do have. You've got your existing employees. If you are willing to come alongside those existing employees, ask them, why do you work here? What keeps you here? That kind of helps you begin to define who we are and how we are different. And over time, what ends up happening, you get better as a business owner kind of describing that. Perhaps as important, you want the employees who work for you, you want them out there telling others like them why this is a good place. So my suggestion would be focus on your existing employees, listen, listen very well, hear what is it they're saying that really resonates, why they choose to stay with you, why they feel that they're valued, and that would basically would define what are those core values that differentiate. And you can leverage those to kind of when you're out there looking for bringing talent in, you can lean into those because you know the truth because you heard it straight from the horse's mouth, your employees. Yeah. And, you know, honestly, um, something you can do because YouTube's is really rewarding shorts right now is you could do a short 45 second or less interview with your employee talking about the benefits of working there and promote that. That's 100 percent free. You need a camera phone and you need to push it out on your social channels. Right. I think this is a good time to see if we maybe have a hot seat. Is there anybody that is actually doing this right now? They're their employer branding or they want to. um have their company evaluated on what would be the best way to do an employer brand and Mike can answer some questions. Chime in, speak up, raise your hand. Anybody? Everybody's doing a killer job at it. Oh, we got a chat here. Um, We are building out the employee experience. Okay, so Ocean, do you wanna talk more about that and see if Mike can help you specifically with your company? All right, no problem. Just seeing, just seeing. All right, we're going to keep moving on. What I'd like to share with you also is the question becomes: All right, you're out there looking for folks. How in the okay, world? Okay, hold on go- one second. Um, we're yeah. gonna we're gonna circle back. Ocean is going to go ahead and type the question, but Mike, I'm going to let you keep going, and then we'll find out what it is. Okay. Um, what we were about to just kind of talk about is um, of all the ways in which we can kind of go about finding people, what's the best way? Uh, My recommendation to business owners is find a platform when you're out there looking that works best for you. I'm suggesting that you do something that's very, 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 very targeted. Um, There are lots of choices out there. Online job boards have just exploded in the last 10 years. My encouragement is pick one or two that you are comfortable with that seem to um, attract the kind of people you're looking for. I'm partial to two. Um, and the one, the two that I'm thinking of immediately would be Indeed. Indeed kind of came out from, from behind and they are kind of considered the premier uh, online job board. And it's premier because the candidate experience is good and the employer experience working with Indeed, it's an easy platform to use. One that I have found that has become extremely helpful is LinkedIn. You know, LinkedIn started off, people thought it as just being an online job board, and that was true. 
in LinkedIn is far more than that is right now. They really want to engage um, their members. Um, and so they're looking for higher engagement. If you are looking for, uh, for folks you can use the likes of an Indeed or LinkedIn and do a very targeted search. Whereas Indeed is probably going to surface more people who are actively looking. LinkedIn, though probably the statistics would show, I've been told by recruiters that the percentage of people who are, who are actually looking for a job is much higher than people realize. It's like 80% of the people, if they get a call describing something's attractive, they're going to they're going to listen. So I guess the question becomes, well, they're going to listen. All, that's all the reason why it's even more important to have a great branding internally from your employees as well. And, and Mike, actually, I want to, I want to dig into this and actually ask a couple of questions because there's also different types of folks and you got to go after them different types of ways. Right. So, yeah. you know, when, when I was a, an, an executive managing very large teams and PLs, I didn't go to indeed. Right. People came to me, right? So there's both proactive and reactive, you know, type searches, if you will. Um, what are best practices to to you know divide when I I go after talent proactively, say with a uh, a recruiter, and or post and get reactive or 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 candidates via Indeed or others. Mm. Um, I guess what I would say, Ken, for those positions that the company has developed a knack for finding and bringing in, then you'd keep that in house. If you keep it in house, then what you've got to do is you read, you know, you use your your website, you use your presence out there on social media. What people tend to forget is LinkedIn has not only individual LinkedIn profiles, there's company profiles. And what is exactly happening is the savvy applicant, if they get into that category, they're going to check you out as a company. Where are they looking? They're looking at a variety of ways. They're going to first go to your website. So your website needs to tell the story, not only the product and service you sell, it needs to be able to tell the story about what the employee experience is going to be like. They're also going to go to look at uh, people who work there. And the best way to do that is through LinkedIn. So they're going to kind of get a, a sense of who is there. They'll go to the LinkedIn company page. They will also go to places like Glassdoor. I didn't mention that, but Glassdoor is a rating system. And they're going to go and say, what do the employees say about this company? And uh, it really is a powerful uh, tool. Employers who are not paying attention to the Glassdoor rating are missing something because it doesn't take much to really hurt a reputation. So th they have the potential candidate has so many ways. But the thing I mentioned a few minutes ago, is if they are connected to somebody on LinkedIn, they're going to reach out to that person and say, yeah. what's it really like there? And if you've got an engaged workforce, whoever they reach out to, what they're going to say is, hey, I'm glad you asked. Um, let me tell you, I know we're linked here, but let me tell you about my experience here. It's going to be personal. They won't go on and on. They're going to basically say, what you hope they'll say, this is a good place to work. They really value their employees, they give them developmental opportunities you can learn and grow. And that's all they got to say. They're going to immediately go and express interest in the position. It's also right. different for generation as well, right? Uh, very much so. You know, yeah. I, I kind of hesitantly, uh, you put Facebook and people think of Facebook being for grandparents. The reality is Facebook can be uh, like other social media platforms. Uh, it can be a very powerful way to get word out that you're looking. What's really most noteworthy about Facebook and Twitter, now known as X, is their ability to do targeted advertising is powerful. If you recognize that it's an unconventional choice, but what you have to be mindful of, though you're doing outreach that way, um, in the same way, if your employee experience is poor, people are going to talk about you uh, on these platforms. And what I would just be mindful of is your reputation as employer is only as good as what people are willing to go out there and, and actually say. So you have to be savvy to recognize which online job boards to use, which social media platforms to use. And my encouragement is don't try to use them all. Find those that fit you best 
and really kind of hone in on that. The last category that oftentimes gets overlooked is most industries have professional associations. And if you're part of that professional association, they have a job board. And it costs little or nothing to post your position on these professional organization job boards. So take advantage. And I never knew about that. these. These are awesome because I, I've, I've never even heard of these um, personally. So um, definitely take note. And by the way, we will send everybody that attended today a um, recap and all the slides. So you don't have to write all of this stuff down. Um, so before we keep going, um, Mike, I got a question and I think it has a little bit to do with marketing. So I'd like to try to answer a couple things and then have you tag team on the rest of it. Does that sound good? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Question is, I think the area I'm looking to improve is the awareness stage. So he's talking about employer branding awareness stage, um, which aligned with the branding. Testimonials is one of the things I'm looking to implement in the next quarter. Any thoughts about how to leverage social platform group, TikTok, TikTok or job fairs to build that brand awareness? So from a marketing standpoint, because my background has been in marketing and public relations for 30 years, especially in the luxury domain and um, there's a lot of things you could do. So if you're trying to attract the right person in your LinkedIn profile, when you do the little I'm hiring, you could put in your tagline something that is specific to how you want to like the type of employee you want to have. So, for example, um, we make customers happy and strive for um an even happier workforce. I mean, I, I'm just winging it on things like that, but you're letting them know in your tagline, something really short and sweet that we care about our employees as much as our customers. Something that lets them know, wow, this is an employee centric company. Um, in terms of like which social media platforms, TikToks, et cetera, et cetera, you've got to, what I've learned about social media is you can't be all things to all people. And Instagram is not a, a place where the shift spot is really going to make valuable connections. If, if I was doing real estate or uh, photography, that'd be a great place for me. I've learned that you should just pick one or two of those platforms and do them really, really, really well. Um, TikTok obviously is, is one way to do it, but YouTube and Facebook have started taking these TikTok you know, shorts and reels and pulling them in. Um, I've done job fairs, expositions for years and years and years. And the thing that I learned there is when you're at like one of those conventions and people walk by, they're immediately like, Ooh, ooh, I don't want to talk to you. I don't want to talk to you, you know, because they feel like they're about to get sold. They feel like they're about to get hit up. I've learned the best thing you can do is have fun, pick a game, you know, have people be playing games and everybody's coming to you watching. Like, what? Why is everybody crowded over here? You make it organic. You have your 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 employee testimonials flashing in the background over and over. And the game draws them in. The board does the selling. And you are not like that leper that everybody's trying to just get their free chapstick and walk away from the booth. Right. <laughs> so. Um, and contests. Contests are really fun things to do. Those are those are my things from, from that question standpoint. Ashin, let me know if you need anything else. Um, and uh, uh, Mike, what would you say uh, as, as far as that? How do you improve the awareness stage? I may sound like a broken record here, but what I would say is the, the best person from an awareness standpoint are your existing employees. And this, you mentioned the employee testimonials. If you can get those testimonials and you can promote those, th that is very telling. Uh, my experience with job fairs and the like is that um, unless you do what Winter just said, you're pretty much wasting your time because you, you, they're just going around with a bag trying to fill it up with the trinkets that you're kind of giving away. That has not necessarily been my experience. It's the best thing to do, particularly if you're just now building your brand. I would think that there's more low-hanging fruit, particularly leveraging your own resources, your website, your presence on social media, uh, your own employees. That would be more the low-hanging fruit that I would suggest starting with. Gotcha. All right. So now that we know we need a great employer branding experience and we need, you know, now we need a great candidate experience. So we've got, we've attracted somebody and they are good candidates. So how do we make them want to pick us because in this day and age, it used to be, we would pick you, we would decide who we want and we'd have plenty of options, but now it's like dating. We need them to pick us. 
you know, when are, we were talking about the employee experience, and so by extension, you kind of step back. What is the candidate experience? How easy is it to uh, express interest in an in, in opening? And so you got to be very intentional. The technology is there by which you can do online application. The platforms are really there. They're pretty savvy. Um, but what you need to be mindful of is that technology in and of itself is not the answer. It's the ease in which employees can express interest. Something I have to kind of caution, though, is that when you're looking at a online application platform on your desktop, it needs to be equally easy to use on your cell phone. Uh, it needs to be what they call mobile optimized. And that is, there are people applying for jobs literally at the traffic light. And it's hard to imagine, but that's particularly true for entry-level positions. Um, people have their phone. Probably everybody who's listening to this right now has a phone within arm's length. More often than not, they are doing everything. They're going to research the company. They're going to research people in the company. They may even apply for a position with their, their phone in hand. Anything you can do to make that easier is to your advantage. The technology is such that if you do choose an online application process, there's so many things you can do. Let me mention a couple of things because I think it's noteworthy. And that is there's a tendency to think that you have one application. It could very well be that if you're recruiting for more than one position, that you develop more than one application so that you can add job specific questions to that. These job specific questions could almost serve in a pre-screening capacity. Because if they're not the right fit, screen them out early on. Um, Are those the same as knockout questions? There, I, I guess the technical answer is the answer is yes. For positions, some there are some. Um, and but you know, but if you're looking at, um, will you need certain credentials? Either you have it or you don't. Right. Um, but by and large, what what I would say is what you're trying to do there is you don't want to be reviewing resumes um, or of. Uh, or applications of people who are not going to be a fit. So if there's some absolutes, you can include that. Here's the thing that I have to kind of caution, and that is sometimes we embrace technology and it's so slick and we're real proud of ourselves, but we forget something important. And that is if people are going to take the time to go in, research a company, express interest in a job, and if their resume goes into a black hole and they hear nothing, that's a waste. It's a waste of their time, but it's also hurting your brand as an employer. So one thing I try to encourage clients to do is if you're talking to someone, it doesn't have to be technology, keep them in the loop. If they're not going to be a candidate, give them the courtesy of saying, thank you for your interest, but we're moving forward with other candidates. It's shocking how often I hear people applying for jobs and they never hear anything. And if you're talking about an employer brand, if you take the time to apply for a position and that company doesn't have the capacity to or desire to even keep you in the loop, that hurts your brand. And I have, I have said this. We both, got another both. question here. Okay. Don't you want some friction? I've noticed when I make it too easy to apply, we get people that are not even reading the post. Uh, that's an interesting point. Um, it's like everything we're going to be talking about over the next few weeks. You've got to find that right balance. So um, uh, that term friction is an interesting choice. And that is, if it's going to serve in a screening capacity, you need to be actually screening candidates and to the point you're making. If it's too easy just to apply a resume and go on, that's a good point. Um, so I don't know if I'm pronouncing um, Ocean's name first correct, but um, good point. Ocean I, like the ocean. Got you. I like it. Um, so I guess what I would just throw out to you, I'll state kind of the obvious. We're talking about the candidate experience. Talent board found that over 80% of the candidates who had a positive experience in the hiring process, they're going to tell others. So we're talking about the employer, uh, employee experience. Now we're talking about the candidate experience to be kind of be mindful of that. Anything else on that? Okay. Um, anybody this, have any questions? This is a good time just to stop and ask. Anybody have anything they want to chime in with? All right, let's talk about developing our employees. Well, um, I have a partiality to this particular topic. Um, I have been described recently as, Mike, you know what you are? And I said, what is that? You say, you're a leadership strategist. I said, tell me more, what do you mean by that? And 
I love that term. Uh, what I have found in as a, an employee working in HR and as someone who works with other companies, employee development is something that companies don't give enough attention to. And it's, it's showing. And that is employees, when they go to work for the company, they want to have the sense they can learn and grow. That is particularly true when you're talking about millennials and younger. And that is Gallup found that nearly 90% of millennials consider professional development and career growth an important part of the job. If you don't pay attention to employee development, you're not going to be able to retain your best employees. It's just that simple. You're so not right, going to right back to the employer branding, make that a part of your employer branding, right? Wouldn't that yes. be a fantastic thing to do? But you got to back it up with reality. You can't just say we present opportunities. You really got to back it up and you got to back it up by being intentional. You need to be, you need to explore what training do the employees need? And sometimes it's job specific uh, training. What do they need to learn so they continue to kind of grow? You know, it's funny when we're talking about um, growth, oftentimes people think that it's an upward progression and oftentimes it is, but growth can also be defined laterally. How are they getting better at who they are and what they can kind of con contribute? Um, smaller companies struggle with this next bullet, and that is you want to offer career advancement paths. Um, you have to be cre more creative if you're in a smaller company. But if you've got the opportunity to move people along career paths, many people want to be able to see that there's growth opportunities. Some are happy where they are, and that's perfectly okay. But if you've got folks who want to grow the company, you have to be intentional. You have to create those paths. Um, and the best way to do that is to embrace mentoring as a way to do so. Yeah, uh, mentoring there's, there's an just real quick, there's an interesting trend out there also. And believe it or not, I, you know, I had a, a client with, what was it, 25 employees, and that's it. And they went out and hired a person, and it's a role called a dream manager. If mm -hmm. any if ever heard of that, you should go check mm -hmm. it out. There's a book out there. They're actually offering certifications on this and everything. And this is $130,000 salary that they pay for this person. But this person's entire job was to establish and sit down with every employee and help map out both professionally and personally what their goals are and help them actually obtain those uh, those goals. And uh, the CEO that was doing it was pretty interesting. He has an SAP consulting firm. So, you know, he pays his, pays his consultants pretty well, right? But his attitude is like, look, if this helps me uh, attract two people, and save one person, the role is paid for itself in full, right? So these individuals would sit down, map out their financial goals, right? You know, map out what, what you know, their, their, help them with uh, their kids' education. So, uh, and you can have different uh, conversations with the employees versus your boss. So just an interesting- It really sounds like almost like an accountability position packaged in the way of, you know, how do we hit your dreams? Yeah, yeah. But, uh, but it, it is something that, you know, not just big companies are looking at these days. I thought I'd toss that out. There's a whole book on it called The Dream Manager Program, if anyone's interested. And Ocean, that might be a good book for you with some of the things that you're look at, actually looking at. There's some really good yeah. insights. Sorry about that, Mike. Like no, no, that. no. That, that, that dovetails very, very nicely. You know, when people say, Mike, I know you're an executive coach. What does that mean? I, I, I never used the term that you just used, Ken, but for a coaching engagement to really work, you listening to the client and you're really trying to find out what is it they're really trying to accomplish. And more often they give you the superficial answer. As I'm working with clients, I'm digging for what do they really want? What are those aspirational things? In some cases, what are those dreams? And when I'm working with clients, there's a tendency to think, well, we only deal with business related matters. That usually is where we start. But it can move into other aspects. So I'm not familiar with that concept, Ken, but I am doing that daily in my role as coach. And what I'm finding when I'm working with leaders one-on-one, -on -one, um, that's what makes coaching real because we're really working on things that matter most to them. Uh, what do they aspire to do? 
Um, I've not heard of the company having a set along position on that. I think that's cool. It's good to know. Um, it looks like I'm supposed to move on to the next category, but I want to just very, very briefly, I mentioned uh, mentoring for a moment. Can I just real quickly slip something in? And that is mentoring, oftentimes you think of it's, it's someone who's older mentoring someone who's younger. You can flip that. Mentoring can work the other way around. Why wouldn't you ask someone who's more tech savvy, who grew up with a cell phone in their hand to perhaps come alongside with someone who's in a more senior role? So if you never thought about flipping that, um, that's a concept that's really starting to kind of catch on. So mentoring can go both ways. You know, we're, you cannot have this conversation about attracting and retaining folks without just touching on the, the role of compensation. Um, I'm a certified comp professional. What does that mean? I've had advanced training. And what I can tell you is compensation and related benefits, it can get complicated fast. I'm not suggesting that. What I am suggesting is that if you're as a company owner, you're the CEO of a company, you're trying to figure out what am I supposed to be paying? It's back to that magic balance here. You've got to find the balance between you want to be competitive and you want to be equitable internally. And that is something that is as much art as it is science. But when we talk about compensation, we tend to only think about the financial. There are other things that we need to be kind of mindful of when we're talking about this. Non-monetary benefits, perks, these things all add up and you just gotta be mindful of, it's extremely competitive, uh, Glassdoor, Study shows that 72% of the employees in the U.S., they pay attention to benefits and perks. Yes, they pay attention to pay as well. It's the whole package they're looking at. And what I would also say is that companies sometimes pride themselves. They say, you know what? Yeah, we put together a comp strategy. And I'll ask, when's the last time you revisit it? Mike, there is a balancing act, as you know. So, so you and I work with uh, a, a, a group, if you will, uh, in, in everything. And it's interesting because they, on average, pay 30% below the market. And they have basically no, uh, no turnover across the organization. It's purposeful turnover, meaning not a good employee, we're going to fire you. Um, and my assessment and constantly new talent comes to the table and constantly they hire way below the market and get great talent. And, you know, I think it, it is a balance between both how uh, what their climate is and their culture is not only that, but then also attracting and working with folks that truly fit within their core values. But it, it's interesting. But, you know, and then there's other places where they put a huge focus on compensation and pay above market. Actually, uh, that other individual firm, the, the CPA firm I was referring to, they do that. They pay a high amount, but they lose employees because their their culture they need to focus on still. So it's kind of interesting. I uh, Ken, you made an interesting point that we can't gloss over. And that is, if a company strategically decides they're not necessarily going to pay at market, they might even pay below market, there has to be an offset. And the yeah. offset is, what is the experience that they're giving the employees? Um, what does it feel like to be an employee? Do you feel like you're part of something bigger? If that is the feeling, then you have a culture that people are attracted to. And people have to make a choice. Yeah, And they will nowadays choose fit, choose culture, choose, I want to be part of something bigger. And I, and I think I love the opportunity this might present. They're going to choose that, but you've got to be very intentional and you've got to massage that culture and don't take it for granted. Um, that is but, but achievable. Also make sure that you fire people that aren't in your culture and don't oh. your culture because they'll bring the rest down. And just, just a keynote, Note this too, a lot of a lot of folks will confuse us. There is a core difference between culture versus climate. Some will say, hey, we have Taco Tuesday and we have a foosball table and everybody plays foosball. That is not culture. That is climate. Culture is 
Um, you know, we're family oriented, individual first, we have open door policy and we're casual, right? Think of that sort of environment and then hire an individual that is win at all cost, right? And, and it, you know, that individual probably would not fit within your culture, right? So there's a, there is a true difference between climate versus culture, but sorry about that, Mike. No, 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 that's perfect illustration. You know, when it all kind of comes full circle, we've talked about, you know, how do you attract, how do you hire, how do you develop employees? At the end of the day, the question is, are you keeping the employees you want to keep? And Ken, I want to go back to what you just said. Um, it's been my experience, the companies who are not willing to weed out those who don't fit are shooting themselves in the, in the foot. It brings um, the rest out. It really, really does. Um, and so with that in mind, there's we could spend the entire time we have here just on retention strategies. But a couple of things that, that I'd like to kind of share, um, and that is we know what COVID has done to for, for work. For, uh, for many companies, they figured out how to go to a virtual work setting. Many companies have concluded there's value into that, but most of them are migrating to encouraging, if not mandating, people to come back to work. I came across a statistic recently, it's actually this week, um, that kind of surprised me, but I, but I guess if I think about it, it makes sense. What they're finding is employees today are putting more emphasis on when they work than where they work. And I find that kind of interesting. Most companies have embraced hybrid and hybrid works for some companies. Um, it's, it's something you've got to do, but something that they might be overlooking is when are those employees working? If your business gives you the flexibility to let employees choose when they work, that flexibility can go a long way to retain employees. There's a whole variety of reasons why people might not be able to work those established hours. If you're open to it, what I would share with you is this the studies are starting to show that is carrying quite a bit of um, about a weight there. Um, we could talk about PTO to the cows come home. We know that paid time off is important. Here's what's really interesting. For companies that have it figured out, who have a fully engaged employees, on average, the employees, whatever their PTO is, if they're fully engaged, it's not unusual they end the year and they have PTO they've not used. And yep. so if you take a <laughs> scarcity mentality about PTO, then you might be missing the point. Um, people need and deserve time off. You want people to take time off. But if they really enjoy what they're doing, I think they're making a difference. That's not going to be such a yearning there. So I might just kind of pass that along. I also mention something else too, and that is when when you talk about retention strategies, you oftentimes think about wellness programs. But one thing that I have to kind of point out is wellness is more than gym memberships. I'd like to kind of point out the importance of mental wellness in today's yeah. workplace, especially in today's day and age. Yes. Um, COVID really highlighted um, uh, depression on a major, major scale. And if you do not have an employee assistance program that speaks to the mental health of your employees of all the things you could do, I'm strongly encouraging you to give consideration to it. Um, I, I, I'm a strong believer uh, in that, that mental health uh, carries considerable weight. And so when you're thinking about wellness programs, don't forget about mental health as part of it. Yeah. Um, I want to make one other comment too, and that is you're talking about how do you retain employees? And this is, again, goes back to those employers that are known to give back to their communities. Giving back to community might mean they write a check, but giving back to community and to causes could be that they allow employees to take pay time off to go volunteer for something that matters a lot to them. It could be a homeless shelter. It could be a food bank. It could be a whole host of things. If a group of employees go to do that, the camaraderie that that builds, that sense of, boy, we're making a difference. And my company allow me to take time off to do that. They're not going to wear you out with those requests. But when you're thinking about how do you build um, 
that type of culture, back to Ken's point, be mindful of giving people time off to do that can be very, very powerful as a retention tool. So I know uh, we went through a lot here, and I'd like just to kind of reserve the last part here with questions that folks might would have. Chime on in, y'all. Don't be shy. We covered everything so well that you don't have any, Mike, you did such a great job. Nobody has any questions. Like you just nailed it. <laughs> All right, Mike, I am, um, I, I loved it today. And I know that this is sort of the foundation of what you're going to be doing for the rest of the month. That being said, this is not buildable content. So, um, but, but this is great, great, great foundational work. So we hope to see you guys on the next coming events for the month. This is the only time that we are doing this. This is not something we do very often. Just to show you real quickly, what we did today, it's it's what we call an expert coaching event at the Shift Spot. We sort of opened our doors to the public because we're really about empowering businesses right now in this climate more than ever to make real change. And we want to help. And we want to help on our bottom dollar. And so um, it's just sort of the tip of the iceberg of what we do here at the Shift Spot. We also have executive coaching events where we help the executive with, it's, it's kind of like an ask anything with any problems you have going on. We have our peer solution events. This is where we bring in community and we work out things, issues, hot seats, modern day, um, you know, discussions and like a virtual boardroom setting. And it's all done in our confidential app because one of the things we've learned is it can be lonely at the top and the CEOs and business owners, you know, they want to have a confidential place to hash these things out. We also, you know, what, about what we were talking earlier today, uh, we have our own accountability guide that helps you stay accountable for what you're doing in the shift spot in business and in life. So we focus on leadership, people, sales and marketing, finance, process and systems and mind, body and soul. We have our own wellness program in the shift spot because we know that you have to take care of the person behind the business. And that's you. That's the business owner. Today, we're talking about people. Right. So that's what August is all about. It's all about human capital issues. But we also cover these other things because it's what business leaders tend to struggle with. So there was not a single person that dropped off the call today. So that means that everybody has the opportunity to win this free gap analysis with Ken Paskins. Again, this is a $5,000 value and you would just go to the shiftspot.com forward slash gap to apply. We help you go from where you are in your business to where you want to go. This is about a, you know, it, it'll probably take you about an hour to fill out the questions. It'll probably take Ken about six hours to analyze it and give you his feedback on how to get from where you are to where you want to go. Um, next week, I'm super excited about what we're talking about. It's navigating the multi-generational workplace. I heard a statistic that um, right now there's at least five different generations in the workplace at one time. So I've used um, generational a multi-generational in, in my sales process. So when you're working with a baby boomer sale versus a millennial sale, and it's completely transformed how sales happen. So I can't wait to see what we're going to be doing, talking about it in, in, in the workplace. If you know of a business owner or CEO or entrepreneur that would get value out of what we're doing this month, send them to the shiftspot.com forward slash win to register. Um, we have, you know, we had 83 people sign up today and um, we are just getting started with this awesome content. So before I sign off, because we, we end on time here, is there any questions, anything we can do to serve you guys today before we, before we pop off here? No. Well, next time I know there's going to be um, a lot more activity and action because we we, we welcome it. So um, don't forget to sign up for your free give back gift and feel free to pass this along. Thank you, everyone, for coming today. We uh, we appreciate you from the bottom of our hearts. Hope everybody has a great day. Thanks, everyone. Appreciate it. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.